Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our key, uh, keynote talk. Um, we are live captioning with American Sign Language and interpreting are available for this event. So please turn your captions on or off. Uh, click the CC live caption icon along the bottom of your window so you can adjust the size and the font by clicking on the three dots at the bottom. Um, in your window, it will say more, selecting the subtitle settings. Our language interpreter deploy slash Vidmore Barber should appear as a panelist on your screen. If you experience any issues accessing the captions or interpreters, please message us. All right, and before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from East Lansing, Michigan, founded on indigenous lands by the Peoria, Ottawa and Misaga people, and that our keynote is joining us today from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, founded on indigenous lands once occupied by the Osage people. We are joining this event from places around the world, so I invite you to take a moment to reflect on the land you are joining from, as well as your relationship to those lands and to the indigenous people who have continued to inhabit them. So thank you for joining us today. My name is Tia Riggins and uh, welcome to the research day keynote um, talk featuring Dr. Wood. And I'm going to introduce her and her work. Dr. Cecina Wood is currently a presidential postdoctoral fellow and special faculty at and incoming assistant professor starting of January, 2022 within the biomedical engineering department at Carnegie Mellon University. She received a bachelor's in science in electrical engineering in 2011 and believes the platform of her success sprung from the Pitt Excel program. She is focused on neuroimaging at ultra high field MRI by developing radio frequency instrumentation and a 3D printed head phantom for RF safety assessments. Her dissertation work has been featured in several peer reviewed journal articles, international abstracts, international talks, and a segment of NBC Learn. Her lab focuses on developing and designing multimodal hemodynamic and neuroimaging techniques and analysis to assess vascular dis diseases with neural effects like sickle cell disease. Dr. Wood is one of the University of Pittsburgh's rising African-American awards leaders, National Institutes of Health F31 awardee, New Pittsburgh's Couriers Fab 40 awardee, Nesby's 2017 Mike Shin Distinguished Mem Member of the Year awardee, and Professional Women's Networking awardee. Dr. Wood served two terms as National Chairperson of the National Society of Black Engineers, as well as leadership roles within the organization. She contributes her success of, of her academic career to Drs. Tamir S. Ibrahim, Jenna Kanestorfer, Yvette Moore, and many Nesby Shiros and Heroes. While committing to advancing neurological health, Dr. Wood is also committed to engaging and empower, empowering underrepresented youth to pursue STEM degrees locally and globally. Now, without further ado, here is Dr. Wood presenting her work. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am going to share my screen. Just give me one second. All right. Uh, just let me know if you're able to see that. We can get started. So um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all, the Black and Narrow community. Um, it's a community that has been established that I wish that I would have been able to have during my undergraduate years, but nonetheless, I'm excited to be present um, and speaking with you all here today. The title of my talk is The Fruit of the First in Using uh, Advanced Non-Invasive Imaging Neuroimaging Techniques. And while I feel that it is so important 
to talk about the fruit of the first is because for us in our community, a lot of times we will be the first and I will share some of my experiences with being the first and the fruits that I was able to receive despite the frustration that at times came. Um, but more or less mirror that also my, my experience with mirror imaging. And so with that, I just want to say uh, congratulations to you all being able to uh, hit one year uh, being in existence since last year and creating this community. As it was mentioned, I was previously uh, or am also a former chair of the National Society of Black Engineers. And with that being said, a lot of this of what you were birthed out of reminds me of the National Society of Black Engineers, an organization that was created almost 45 years ago where there were some students out of West Lafayette, the middle of nowhere, almost America, who had this dream to create an entity where there were more Black engineers. And that was the birth and the idea of students. And you all are doing something similar something that was created for us out of a birth and a movement for social justice. And so with that, I just wanna thank everybody who's prepared this event to give us space so that we can be and create technology for the world. Um, and I just wanna to add to uh, be a part of the roll call. So, which was mentioned, I'm an incoming assistant professor in Carnegie Mellon University in biomedical engineering. I'll have affiliations with electrical engineering as well as the Neuroscience Institute. I am a Pitt alum. Uh, I have my electrical engineering degree, as you heard from Pitt, as well as my bioengineering degree from there. I'm a Pitt Excel alumna as well. So hashtag Pitt Excel proud, you might see some of us in the chat. But more so as it returns to my research, I uh, really have been able to uh, work along the boundaries of research, being that I started off as electrical engineer, went into biomedical engineering, worked in neuroscience, uh, also 3D printing and all of these different things. And so the way I classify myself is someone who is a hardware instrumentation and designing that for neural technology, also RF safety assessments, vascular imaging, and then I'll also talk about the applications to sickle cell disease. I want to uh, take time through this talk to talk about the fruit of the first and first kind of give you some insight from my mountaintop experience. So right now I've been able to achieve and get the PhD. I'm finishing up the postdoc and beyond, and I'm at the top. And uh, I wanna share with you the focus that I will have. So I will uh, develop a lab that is, uh, has a goal to develop um, non-invasive hemodynamic imaging techniques and data analysis that are used through three different devices, which you might be most familiar with, magnetic resonance imaging, near-infrared spectroscopy and EEG, using these uh, three tools together to visualize and quantify the uh, management and the treatment of vascular diseases that also have neural effects. So one example of that is sickle cell disease, but I would also like to use these tools on diabetes, stroke, and what have you. And why I feel that for me it's so important is because I'm not necessarily just the engineer that went into engineering because I wanted a project or a product that can be made and uh, assembly line. I wanted to make a product that actually impacts those that we care most about in our communities. And so therefore, I work alongside of clinicians to be able to understand uh, the vascular dysfunction that happens in perfused tissue, correlate that to neural activity, and how can we actually measure the functionality of that, and then also make uh, connections between the social behaviors, or um, different type of biomarkers of pain that are experienced by various type of patients and what can we draw out of that. And so when I mention biomarkers, I know that we have a lot of people in the audience, so I'm gonna summarize really quickly what that means. Let's say you go to the doctor and you get some type of assessment. Essentially what a biomarker is, is all is just an indication of how your body is actually doing. So it has the capacity to make measurements, both functional and physiological, to be able to assess your health and any ailments if you have any. So one example of that might be something as simple as checking your heart rate. It might be actually looking into your lungs, seeing if they're clear, running lab tests and what have you. So 
the doctor will then basically look at your bill of health and see if you're healthy or not. And those different things that are determining your health are your biomarkers. So it is my um, goal to be able to designate and identify new biomarkers in the body so that we can understand some of uh, the world's health challenges. And the way of being able to do this, I do it through cardio, the cardiovascular system, specifically looking at the brain. The key focus areas of my lab um, will be to do a few different projects. And I'm just saying these high level, we'll get into the nuts and bolts a little later, but um, one being a project to actually look at the spatiotemporal variation in the hemodynamic response. That's the response in which you can actually measure um, the vascular system and be able to use various technologies to do that. Another is investigating the biomarkers of cerebral health and being able to build both a structural and functional profile of being able to assess what's happening in the brain due to these vascular diseases. Another is perfusion imaging and being able to assess cortical temperature in the body and how does that um, intertwine as a new biomarker to indicate various things that are happening within the brain. And then the latter is inclusive technology. And so because of this forum and who's here, um, I'll speak a little to that and some of our team that are a part of this project. So inclusive neurotechnology, some of you might be familiar with this very distinguished young lady um, who is here, Arnell, you'll hear from her uh, later in the week. But Arnell, I met her as I was finishing up my PhD and she was presenting at our BME forum at Car Carnegie Mellon University of a novel way in which she designed electrodes that happen to work for coarse, coarse and curly hair. And typically those are individuals who are of African descent or maybe Middle Eastern or Indian, but nonetheless, um, EEG does not has great contact on people who happen to have long hair, but when you add coarse hair, it becomes more complicated. And so she's done phenomenal things. A company has started out of that. But in addition, um, we're be beginning to see as a team how can we begin to focus on not this just necessarily in EEG, but other uh, neural technologies as well. So functional near infrared spectroscopy, can we do something similar in designing optical probes that work well on cur coarse and curly hair? So that's a project that we're working on. My team members, um, current postdoc advisor and soon to be colleague, um, Yana Kanestorfer, Polkit Grover, myself, and Dr. Jasmine Quaza and Arnell are all working together on this uh, project. In addition, we're also focusing on the melanin concentration, uh, which happens to be uh, a challenge for near infrared spectroscopy. So we'll get into that a little later, probably uh, through the panels that you're here this week, but I just wanted to highlight, these are some of the focuses of which my work will um, be on. When we talk about neuroimaging modalities, there are so many that are out there. And for a snapshot, because this community is probably really experienced in a lot of them, I'm going to just profile exactly uh, what's out there. So you have ultrasound, EEG, PET, MRI, CT, X-ray, and NIRS, and they all have different functions. Some of them are classified as being portable, not portable, have really phenomenal spatial resolution, temporal resolution, it might work as well, really well in real time. But for me, and as far as my experience and what I'm gonna share with you today, it's really alongside of uh, working with advanced MRI and what was the benefit of that and the technologies that I've been able to develop out of that, as well as the hemodynamic response, working with uh, near infrared spectroscopy. So um, just setting back and setting more of the tone um, when I set on this journey to go get my PhD, I am the first in my family to go to graduate school and to obtain a PhD. And so there is so much excitement that you get when you get that offer and you're like, oh, I'm going uh, into graduate school. I'm going to do this. And you see all the success. 
But sometimes what you don't see is that valley and the experiences that you have in that valley and what could come out of that valley. Sometimes it could be that you feel isolated. Sometimes is that you're frustrated because you're trying to get something to work and you might be the only expert in that. And so I want to talk to you about my experiences with that and how that leveraged me forward um, to obtain my PhD. So the first, very first thing um, as far as neurotechnology for me uh, was really translating from electrical engineering and learning all of the vernacular uh, about the brain and all of these various things, which to me were so many different buzzwords, but it really resonated to me at some point. And it just happens that I work with magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and so if you've ever been inside of an MRI machine, your experience might be something like this, where you're laying inside of the bore. Uh, you might feel claustrophobic or some sense, but when you go on the inside, basically what's trying, what we're trying to do is try to uh, alter your water molecules within your body so that we can see what's on the inside of the brain. So we take magnetic energy, transfer that to uh, signals, ones and zeros, you get an image and I'll explain how that works. So when your body first goes inside of the scanner, you happen to have um, all sorts of atomic nuclei in your body. Those that are of most interest with MRI happen to be water molecules. They happen to have also a random orientation, which is seen here where the vectors of these magnets are in various directions. But as soon as you go inside of that scanner, you will experience external magnetic field strength, which your water molecules then align as seen here. What then happens is that a radio frequency pulse is sent to be exactly 90 degrees. And so you have the nuclei, which are oscillating almost like a tabletop and spinning. As they process and rotate, it is that signal at 90 degrees, that radio frequency pulse, which we're trying to obtain. And the way of being able to do that is by using antennas and creating our field uh, instrumentation. And so if you look in the scanner, almost like if you were to look at the hood, when you first look in, it's this big device, but when you take the hood off, there are a lot of components on the inside. So you have gradient uh, coils, you have uh, radio frequency coils, and for today's talk, I'll focus on uh, radio frequency coils. So radio frequency coils are hard well de hardware devices or antennas that can be used either to transmit, receive, or transmit and receive radio frequency signals at the frequency of interest. So the Larmor frequency, and this is what you might hear, 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, or 7 Tesla. There are current commercial um, devices that exist that are radio frequency coils that are out there, such as the Nova coil, the rapid coil, and these were in-house coils, which we built in the lab that I was a part of uh, for my doctorate. So the tr um, transverse electromagnetic coil, this is one that's more known at lower fields and the tic-tac-toe coils, the novel design of which we use. The whole point of being able to actually design these coils and why it's necessary is because when you go at higher field strength, you can no longer use simple circuitry such as resistors and inductors and uh, capacitors, but you, the, that's because the electromagnetic fields are no longer uniform. They become non-uniform and you have to design very complex geometries to be able to get uniformity in the magnetic field. And so the tic-tac-toe coil was something that I spent so much of my PhD uh, helping to design um, and the fruits of that labor did not come until after, you know, I was well into my postdoc, but nonetheless, we built this coil, um, which you see here, it has five different panels and on those panels, you have different excitation ports, four of them. Um, these different rods, which are placed on the inside of the copper, give you an opportunity to change um, the matching uh, impedance to 50 ohms, which is one of interest, or the tuning frequency. So for 7 Tesla, 297.2 megahertz is the frequency of interest. And so you have to guess exactly the distances that these rods must go into to give you uniformity that you experience here. So on your right, what you're able to see is a point, um, 0.6 uh, millimeter isotropic, meaning in the X, Y, Z direction, image of the human brain 
at seven Tesla MRI. And you can see that you can see the different gray matter, white matter, cerebellum, even some of the veins experienced here uh, in the uh, eyes as well that all the liquids appear in this image to be more clear. Um, but you have phenomenal uh, resolution that you aren't able to get at the current hospitals. And so why, why is this important? What's the overall need of being able to do this? And that's because uh, at lower field strengths, you can see what's in the brain. And this is 1.5 Tesla. The whole goal of this image is to be able to show you white hypermatter intensities, which um, can correlate to strokes or other type of cognition issues. But at 1.5 Tesla, why you can see the left hemisphere of the brain and make out the anatomy, which you cannot see as well is this white hypermatter intensity here, it's grainy. Where if you look at three Tesla, which most hospitals, when they say they have high resolution MRI, this is the machine that they have, you can see a white hypermatter intensity here. But if you go higher to a higher field strength, such as seven Tesla, um, what you see is a few more, but, um, in addition, you see something here, which it looks as though there's some type of signal loss. And so what's happening is that as you increase in your frequency, um, you're actually decreasing the wavelength of the water, uh, the water wavelength itself. And so to overcome that, what is actually happening is that you don't have any real signal loss here what your experience is radi radio frequency uh, destructive interference. And so these vectors are canceling each other out. So you have to use nonlinear algorithms to be able to overcome that. And so the way to identify this, you must do this step first before putting anyone inside of the scanner is um, to be able to first look at numerical imaging and then experimental to identify where these um, holes are, for lack of better words, and try to overcome that challenge so that you have uniformity. And so that was the goal of our larger work as a team, which we were able to do. Um, if you look at the top, this is the performance of the tic-tac-toe coil, where I'm only showing you the radio frequency field map for uh, the brain, so from the very top of the brain to the bottom, the base of the cerebellum. Um, in addition to that comparison is to the Nova coil, so Siemens commercial coil, which is currently out there. And what you're able to see is that 90 degree flip angle, which I said we want to be able to get, that gives us uniformity, that's where this red is, and the blue, that's signal loss. Um, and so you can see more signal loss in different parts of the cerebellum or in the temporal lobe in the Nova coil, which is already commercially out there, that isn't as apparent in the tic-tac-toe coil. So looking at this same um, outcome and something that you're more familiar with, looking at a T2 uh, sequences where you can see the differences between the cerebral spinal fluid as well as different parts of the brain. This is a comparison between the tic-tac-toe on the left and the Nova coil on the right. If I freeze that just for a second to show you the radio frequency maps that are um, achieved for each of those, which you can see something similar as you saw two slides ago, is that the tic-tac-toe coil is performing better and you see less interference in areas such as the, uh, the temporal lobe and the cerebellum. And so with that, as much as important it is to have uniformity uh, within the radio frequency fields, it's also just as important to have that in the electric field. So while you can create um, uniformity with the B field, that's sometimes what the radio frequency field is called, you also have the E field, the electric field which is also seen. And so with the E field, this is the one that's harmful. So something similar and not just necessarily um, MRIs, but also in cell phones, you have this concern as well. So the electric field is proportional to the specific absorption rate. And what can happen is what you see here, some type of burning of the tissue that can be experienced on the surface of the skin. So this was from EEGs that weren't properly MRI safe that went inside of the scanner and they had burning or bubble on the skin. 
um, to deep inside. If you were to happen to have an implant, this what you see here is burning of the tissue. And so RF heating is an entire field within MRI that is important in RF safely, safety. But as much as you focus on the electric field, you also care about the temperature. And so um, the ways of being able to do that safely without necessarily putting someone in the scanner first is designing phantoms. So phantoms are a way to characterize the electromagnetic field um, within biological tissue and understand the interaction between that. They're used to be able to have various types of MRI safety evaluations, optimize various sequences. So that's just being able to categorize and look at the brain in so many different ways so that clinicians can identify things as well as uh, coil performance. And so um, for most of, um, for a very long time, they use very basic phantoms, which are seen here, a spherical phantom, which doesn't necessarily mimic a human. And then this is a more geometric phantom, which is used in um, diffusion sensor imaging and water tracking, um, but still it doesn't necessarily correlate to the fiber tracks as well in the brain. And so in 2007 and later, there became this evolution of various type of more anthropomorphic phantoms. And so uh, out of a group in Harvard, they developed the Kima phantom to work with EEG and uh, MRI. And within uh, the cell phone community, they developed the SAM phantom. But these phantoms just have one biological tissue on the inside. And so much of my uh, work began to actually focus on developing uh, phantoms that could categorize both the electromagnetic characterization of those radio frequency coils, as well as the thermal characterization to see and ensure that the performance was safe. And so in doing that, this was the head phantom that I developed, uh, which are able to see here is just kind of the evolution and the steps that I um, actually obtained going through making this phantom. So first you take any MRI uh, imaging data set, you then classify that into various tissues. So this had eight different tissue types and then you took the geometry or I took the geometry of these various tissue types and put it into STL format. And so that is something that CAD where CAD software such as uh, Geomagix or uh, SolidWorks, which you can actually use, and then 3D print such models. And so you can do this for any portion of the body that you actually care about. But for this project, we cared most about the head for various neuroimaging um, technologies, but also the shoulders, because a lot of the uh, electromagnetic power deposition uh, happens in the shoulders. So they, these are just a few slides, just to kind of, in a very nice way, show you uh, what the overall outcome is. First, imaging, classifying that with a high resolution MRI, then uh, detailing it for eight different tissue types. I chose fat, bone, and skin because skin is too thin, even though it's electromagnetically conductive, it's too thin to actually print. So we just uh, classified that all together. And let me clarify that that was too thin to print at the time. So then um, we actually uh, took this and I put it inside of a CAD model and developed it into five different parts that we can put together later. And I could fill it with different biological tissues that were um, comparable electromagnetically to the human body tissue. And so in that, I had to also design it in such a way that you can fill it with their different uh, fluids, but um, various type of air bubbles are seen to be as an issue. And so you don't necessarily want those inside because they can create artifacts in the MRI machine. So of the tissues that were classified here, these are the eight different tissues. These are the ones that you were probably most familiar with. So. Um, the eyes actually broke down into the cornea, the vitreous humor, the eyes, uh, solara, and these were weighted averages of those tissues all together to correspond to the conductivity, the permittivity, as well as the density. And why was this important to actually um, break it down in such a way is because also we had to um, simulate this as well. So to be able to see the actual performance of designing this phantom, see if it compared to uh, 
an actual human or a spherical phantom, which was already out there, was a test that I did for a separate paper. And so the actual person, which the phantom was developed out of, is to the left. And the phantom itself was filled with two different fluids, one of them being homogeneous brain media, the other being anthropomorphic media, so all of the different tissues together in comparison to uh, the spherical phantom. And so the first thing that I wanted to do was be able to see one was this feasible. And indeed it was. Um, and so uh, in comparing it, what you can see is again, we're looking for that flip, that very high 90 degree flip. You don't get that uniformity that you get at 3T, but you do get it um, at, uh, at lower field strengths. It's quite different at higher field strengths. And so what you can see very quickly, just looking at it, you can see from the actual volunteer versus spherical phantom, there's differences um, that you're able to see. But when you put the actual phantom that I developed and the tissues together, what are the overarching um, outcomes that you can then see? Well, the heterogeneous phantom is more similar as far as the shape and the profile to the actual spherical phantom. But here we actually put water media, the same water media that was in the spherical phantom there to see if there were any type of differences. And so what we were able to then conclude is that shape does play a part in a factor of this, but also the media does as well. And so I took it a step further, did this uh, numerically and made that comparison at both 3T which is known for a higher field, the standard for the hospitals, as well as 7T. So looking at the uh, magnetic field strength alone, I added the brain dope media. So that's having the permittivity and the conductivity of the average brain. Um, here's the water. And then here is the heterogeneous media compared to the actual baseline of the person that the phantom was developed after. Um, in the numerical model of that. And so what you can see is that the water has very much high intensities uh, versus these, these three pretty much look the same. And so what we were able to conclude is that at 70, whether you use heterogeneous uh, head media or you use brain dope media, uh, your electromagnetic um, properties might be the same. Whereas if you look at 3T, there's almost all uniformity that's experienced here. And so at 3T, any media is comparable uh, despite the shape. So then I took this one step further and I looked at the electrical or the electromagnetic differences and broke it down into all fillable compartments, which you saw in various slides, as well as the midbrain and the brain. And what we were able to see is that um, at 7T and 3T, there are very various peak areas where the electric field is high. Um, and where it is highest is specifically in that midbrain area. And so while you cannot um, really quantify that alone by just looking at the electromagnetic field, you must then take that further and look at the thermal um, calculations of that. And what I was then able to do was to take Pinay's bioheat equation and be able to take that phantom that I developed numerically and be able to classify it in two different areas. So I took the actual person, which the phantom was developed after, and then the phantom itself with the heterogeneous uh, fields and made models with the heat capacity, the metabolic um, rate, and had parameters for that, as well as the perfusion. And then as an input for the actual heat, I used the specific absorption rate. So I took the electric fields, um, which are obtained from the overarching um, finite domain, uh, finite difference um, time domain, and then put that inside of the bioheat equation and let it run. And so we applied an input power for a continuous 10 minutes. This was the FDA regulated um, specific absorption rates, which are allowed to run. And we allowed it to run for a few days just to see what the overarching outcome is. And what we were able to identify and make a comparison between 3T and 7T is that for the actual segmented human head phantom, this is what I also call the perfused phantom, 
is that in 3T, there are a few high peak areas where you can see an increase in 10 minutes, about 1.83 degrees. Where if you were actually to show the phantom itself, which doesn't have any type of um, perfusion, uh, what you can see is that there's a constant rise all the way up to seven uh, degrees, and this happens on the boundaries. Um, and so what you see here, I took out the fat bone and skin is because they are uh, and will be electromagnetically higher. So it will almost saturate the image. And we just cared about the actual fillable biological tissues alone. But what this began to say to us is that the interpretation is that uh, perfusion does have a way of actually cooling down the temperature. And so to interpret this further, I then took various key areas where there were high uh, spot locations and began to see, okay, what is the differences that I can see in the actual model of that person versus the actual phantom? And if you look here, if you look um, on the left side of that brain, you can see that there's a linear increase at both 7T and 3T, but for the a uh, phantom that happens to have perfusion, there's a linear increase, maybe to a minute, and then it begins to kind of dissipate. And so this says what the role of perfusion is, but there's also an argument for maybe a different audience of what actually does the metabolic rate have an influence in this factor. So along from uh, simulations, I then also did a thermal characterization of actually putting probes at those same locations just to see if the actual phantom that we were developing would be useful um, to the overall radio frequency and MRI community as well as the cell phone community. And the precision of that for not just 10 minutes, but for 30 minutes was that it was almost exact in that same location to the numerical um, calculations. And the excitement that I had there, one of a few. One, um, the time that was taken to actually do a collective lab project and then separately do a phantom project that was for myself in the greater community, I saw a few different things. One, something that we worked on that at times felt like there was no end in sight actually outperformed uh, commercially what was available. Um, two, I developed this phantom that is useful for different communities outside of just the M MRI community. And I was able to lead a project on the interdisciplinary uh, boundaries of, of the research that my, my advisor worked on, which allowed me to create a space and do things um, as a scientist that I was not necessarily privy to, nor necessarily always had the exact support, but I had the guidance to get there. And so um, what that then taught me in our lab was that uh, the magnetic field distribution at 7T, this is where phantom, uh, anthropomorphic phantom is most useful, but also uh, thermal evaluations are necessarily to use a phantom at 3T and 7T. So the future work of that project um, really uh, took off. And so uh, this phantom that I designed then went into a lot of media posts. A lot of people were excited that you can 3D print things, um, but potentially for clini clinicians, they became very interested of how can we potentially put things on the inside of the, the brain and be able to potentially have implants and study uh, if there's any type of interaction between implants and biological tissue, something that you cannot do humans in humans. Maybe you can do in animals, but you can't do in humans. Um, and then we begin to take the uh, tic-tac-toe coil, which was developed and utilize it for a wide variety of studies. And so outside of designing these things, I also began to pick up a skill set of working alongside of patients in various disease populations. So those were sickle cell disease, uh, caretakers, people who happen to have depression or dementia, bipolar, and what have you. So I began to learn their stories while they were inside of this device that we developed. Um, also looking at their images and what that really made me think of a scientist, like, what do I wanna do next? Where do I wanna be? Where do I see myself growing? And so, 
uh, we were able to look at the hippocampus as a biomarker and the size of various people's brain to see if it was shrinking, if they were aging, was that hippocampus size changing if they happened to have sickle cell disease? Uh, was it changing if they had dementia? And so all of these uh, stories together really made me ponder. Um, in, a different, in, in addition, we also had white hypermatter intensities, which are kind of like these white things that you can see here um, inside of the, the human brain that lead to cognition. And this is for someone who happens to have sickle cell disease. So that then led me next to um, still being in the Valley experience, you know, finishing the PhD, but a postdoc is in sight. A postdoc is in sight, why is that necessary? Well, I've done all this work, but necessarily right now, my CV doesn't show all of the papers that are about to come. I might have one or two papers, but not enough are there where I could have an academic career right away. So I have to consider a postdoc. And at the time I'm like, getting a postdoc, does that necessarily mean that I have to do a PhD all over again? And no, it didn't. But I'm sharing that to share uh, some of the cool things that I shared, uh, found in my postdoc and what were to come out of it. So I began to focus on not just necessarily the structural anatomy that you can see in the brain and identify the cool images of the brain, but how does the brain actually work? And so this is where I picked up the skill set of working with near infrared spectroscopy in Dr. Kana Storfer's lab. And essentially just to kind of give a really fresh overarching uh, introduction. And this isn't the full story, but just for the sake of us talking, uh, neurons demand energy in the form of oxygen and glucose. Uh, the blood supplies energy and oxygen through hemoglobin and the brain ability to actually reserve energy is poor. And so the ways of doing that is to uh, increase the blood flow in areas in which the neurons fire. In these designated areas, you happen to have the hemodynamic response, which can also be a biomarker for disease or cerebral health. Ways to quantify that could be one through functional MRI or the bold signal or optical imaging such as near infrared spectroscopy. Um, so the way that NEARS works, I told you how MRI works, but the way that NEARS works is essentially you you're taking light and you're shining that light through tissue and detecting it at a given distance um, away from that original light source. And uh, hemoglobin in particular is the um, absorber of interest that we care most about. And so the cool thing about near infrared spectroscopy is that you can actually see hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin in deoxygenated hemoglobin, which MRI doesn't necessarily have the capacity to do. So in addition, you can also look at measuring um, oxygen saturation as well. And so you do that through two different wavelengths. There are more wavelengths that you can do as well if you're concerned to do that. Um, but this was my technology of interest and to apply it to the sickle cell disease uh, community. And so sickle cell disease is one of the most common hemoglobinopathies uh, worldwide. It affects 100,000 Americans, mostly of African descent and millions um, worldwide. And so it's a disorder in your blood vessels, which you can see you have these regular donut blood vessels, uh, red blood cells that are flowing, and then these sickle shape or kind of crescent shaped are the ones that block blood flow. And so this can cause or all sorts of uh, damage to the central nervous system, uh, particularly in children and as well as adults. It leads to a cascade of events of inflammation and oxidative damage. And it, it's an increasing need to really understand further this cause for abnormal perfusion um, that is created by this disorder. There are a lot of research methods that are out there, but to be very frank in this community, uh, we need more, this disease needs more. And it's very interesting how when I was interviewing, a lot of people asked, well, is this an orphan disease? In a way it is. And I hope that uh, I can be someone that sheds light on the importance of it. And so the current tools that are used that have actually prevented stroke in children who happen to have sickle cell disease, one being transcranial um, Doppler ultrasound. It can do that in larger vessels, but has the challenges doing that in smaller vessels, such um, as the microvasculature inside of the brain. 
you have CT and MRI, but they don't have the ability to necessarily go that deep for high resolution. And so current screening uh, methods for sickle cell disease or small vessel disease are poor, as well as their ability to actually um, see oxygen saturation as well. And so one way of being able to detect cerebral autoregulation um, is a new biomarker of health. And this is one way which we wanna be able to detect sickle cell disease. It's currently um, seen as a biomarker of health for stroke and has been for some time. And essentially what, what we want to do is be able to take the blood pressure and imagine that blood pre pressure responds in a step function, which is seen here. The blood flow will correspond as well where you would have that dip and then all of a sudden you will have an increase. And so the question or the name of the game is how quickly can you come back to the baseline? Well, in order to measure these, you can have sinusoidal uh, measurements that you'll see here. And when cerebral, cerebral autoregulation is intact, meaning that it's working well, the blood flow and the blood pressure will be out of phase. But if they're impaired, they will be in phase. And so with this very, uh, not simple, but with this very kind of like intuition, what we wanna be able to see is can we take the time of the sign, your sort of waves, and actually transform them in the frequency domain to phase, phase differences. And that is something which I've done for my postdoc. So there were some individuals who were able to uh, do this in larger vessels and smaller vessels using transcranial Doppler, um, Doppler ultrasound, um, looking at both the cerebral blood flow as well as the blood pressure and being able to get people to breathe at a particular pace. So six breaths per minute and look at two different sides of the hemispheres of the brain and see if there was any type of phase lag. And so on the ipsilateral side, this is the affected side by the stenosis, which you can see is that the cerebral blood flow in the, um, in the artery is, is in phase with the blood pressure, meaning that cerebral autoregulation is out of, um, is not, uh, working properly. But for the contralateral side, this is the healthy side, this is the side that is out of phase. And so if we're able to see this in the larger vessels, they then say, well, can we see this in the smaller vessels? And yes, um, they were able to do it, uh, looking at not necessarily blood pressure and blood flow, but oxygenated, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And with that same method, I wanted to do this in the sickle cell disease population. So we sat down as a group and we said we would expect patients who happen to have sickle cell disease would have impaired cerebral autoregulation and lowered measured uh, cerebral oxygen saturation compared to healthy race match, con uh, race match controls. Um, and so for those who were normal, what you will see is that oxy and deoxygenated uh, hemoglobin will be out of phase roughly having about negative 180 degrees versus if they were impaired, there would be a much larger phase lag. And in those that have a sickle cell disease, they will also have a decrease in the oxygen saturation. And so uh, we developed this actual um, experimental um, paradigm where someone would be sitting in a chair with nearest probes uh, connected to them on two sides of their forehead. And so I asked them to breathe at a particular pace three different frequencies, 0.1 hertz, 0.167 hertz, and 0.125 uh, hertz, and they will alternate. And we did this in almost an even group, 11 of them having a sickle cell disease and 14 of them being normal uh, controls. And uh, the overarching goal was to see with those, the magnitude of phase, where we were able to see something with the amplitude ratio of the oxygen deoxyhemoglobin and the same thing for the phase differences. And uh, really quickly, uh, what we were able to find were just a few things. So for deoxy and oxy, there were non-zero phase lags, which was good. This meant that the contact was great. And there were influences of blood flow and blood, uh, blood volume changes. And so for the actual healthy controls, they fell within a range of not necessarily 180 degrees, but between negative 200 and negative 240 degrees at these three different paces. And uh, this was good, a good sign because this matched with what the literature was out there. And for the sickle cell disease population, they actually were um, 
outer phase, which we expected. And so this showed that there's some, time, some type of vascular obstruction or impairment of cerebral auto regulation leading to changes in the blood transmit chain. Um, also saw the same thing looking at the magnitude of the, the amplitude uh, ratio of oxy and deoxy. And what we were able to see here is that there were a higher um, deoxy amplitude ratios at much lower frequencies, which indicated slower blood transmit times. And so overall, the last thing which we did was look at the uh, oxygen saturation levels and we were able to find that in those that had sickle cell disease, they had lower, not greatly lower because of the population that we looked at, but it was much lower than the controls. So the outcome and the findings for this particular work were one of a few. One, it was evidence that we can use um, finite uh, or frequency domain mirrors can be used to assess cerebral autoregulation in the sickle cell disease. We can further extend the work to be able to look at different populations as far as age for sickle cell disease. So this would be just as imperative in children where they use transcranial Doppler um, ultrasound as a screening tool. Could mirrors also be one? And we were able to also see that um, there's a not noticeable reduction in the oxygen saturation. Uh, this is seen as a novel uh, cerebral biomarker of brain vasculopathy of sickle cell disease. And it could be potentially a tool of evaluating various treatments in sickle cell disease. And so the next step um, for my lab would be, of course, to continue this work, look at a, a larger population, both in children and adults, and be able to see for those three frequencies or more, what are the associations that we can see between blood flow and blood pressure? Can we use various treatment drugs for sickle cell disease, such as the approved voxelator, FDA approved medication, or other types of treatments such as blood transfusions to actually see the impact of these drugs um, for this potential uh, particular population. Um, so I just wanna bring it back home with a few slides, uh, as well as words of encouragement, and I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. Um, but I just want to bring it back home on some of the things which I plan to focus on. Again, my overarching work and my long-term goal for my lab is to develop a multimodal non-invasive hemodynamic imaging technique and data analysis using these three technologies here that can be used to visualize and quantify management and treatment of vascular diseases that happen to have neural effects, starting with sickle cell disease, but working with other vascular diseases. Um, of course, if you have an experience, you know, working with cognition or pain, I would love to have you work alongside of me. Um, this is definitely a big thank you slide to everyone that I work with uh, to be able to achieve where I am today. Uh, they've made it all possible in these two different labs that I worked in. Um, but I want to go back and leave you with some words of wisdom from the mountaintop experience and getting a PhD. Uh, I am the first in my family to receive a PhD. I am the first Dr. Wood. I am the first of many. Um, here is a picture of my siblings and my, my loving parents. And um, this was something where they were able to support me in so many ways going through. Um, but none of them had a doctorate. None of them experienced what I was going through. And in fact, they all went to HBCU. So my experience alone has been so different. But for me to be the first there, as you saw in previous slides, there were a lot of fruits that came with that, but there were also a lot of frustrations. And so with that, the fruit of the first, I was able to go to my first neuroscience conference uh, back in 2014 in Italy. And um, I love Italy, so I'm like, of course I'm going. But in that, this was the first time that I was actually in a neuroscience community and there were only seven people that I was saw that looked like they were of African descent, only seven. Um, and so to me, that was like, wow, here's this big community of people working on these type of things. Um, here I am maybe three years into my PhD, just started national chair of NSBE and uh, I don't know, there's such a big world, but there are so many different problems that we can also approach. And the fruits of the labor, of course, would be, you know, you're working hard in the lab, you get to have some gelato while you're in Italy. But at this time, uh, 
my friend Yujuan, she was the only other female in the lab. And when she left, here I was again, the only person in the lab to have uh, be a woman. Uh, but in addition, the only American. And so much of my only experience, I was the only African American to the only woman in my electrical engineering classes. But in bioengineering, I was the only African American American in my lab. And so much of my colleagues' experience became um, through the lens of an African American woman through the Trump era. Who would have thought? Um, but we became very good colleagues and out of that very fruitful conversations came. And so for much of my frustration of starting a project where you see so many people publishing at so many different times, you know, certain labs can publish really fast, but because we were innovating, things took some time. And so one of my first awards was my F31 award that I received um, this supported a lot of my dissertation work. And this really got me excited because it also aligned with my proposal. And it was something that gave me confidence in the midst of the valley that I can continue and make this happen. Maybe my fifth year, and it seemed like forever, I'm like, I, I had wrote this publication for so long. And I'm like, if this thing doesn't get submitted, I'm done. But it was submitted. And so with it being submitted, uh, the beautiful part of that is that it was one of the most cited publications in the lab and one of the most cited publications in plus one as well. And so applying for my PhD, a lot of people uh, or my postdoc and faculty positions, a lot of people were saying, well, why did you publish in plus one? Why not other things, you know? But there's a lot of controversy in building the type of technology that we built because other people felt as though it did not work as effective. And so they, I, I say to you that it's not always concrete on as far as like you publish and it will be submitted and accepted. There are different things that go along that way. But if you have a dream, you know, stay focused and um, stay forward and be committed. And then uh, I like to show this slide too, because this is me going to Paris. This was my last conference at ISMRM in person. And I was able to take my mother on a graduate student stipend. I asked my advisor and he let me take my mother with me to Paris. So a dream of hers that I was able to materialize. And so sometimes when you're the first, you will also bring your family along and have experiences with them along the way. Um, and so with that, as much as those spaces were created for me to exist um, and be the first, I want to create a fruitful opportunity for other students to be mentored by a good mentor, I would say myself. Um, so if you are looking for a lab to join, feel free to consider applying to my lab. I, I am looking for master students this year, but we'll have two PhD positions in the fall. Um, that I'm looking for. If you're an undergraduate and you want to do summer research for next year, um, let me know. There are a lot of cool projects that I didn't necessarily mention here that you could be a part of. Um, and if you're a postdoc, I'm looking for a postdoc in the year of 2023, but it's an opportunity for you to uh, be involved. If you're a GEM fellow, I'm a GEM alum. Um, Carnegie Mellon looks at uh, GEM fellows in neuroscience electrical engineering, biomedical engineering, and other in engineering, if you feel as though potentially my lab or other labs are suited, I'd be happy to speak with you. Uh, if you're an NIHK00 fellow, you want active member uh, mentorship, again, my lab is a place to consider. But please also take in consideration that uh, Carnegie Mellon has different campuses. So there's also a Carnegie Mellon Africa campus. You can actually go to Carnegie Mellon Africa no matter where you live in uh, Africa and uh, go to school there and then receive your PhD later uh, here in the States. So consider that as an option. And so just to close out, um, you can definitely amplify, amplify my research in a few ways by citing me, um, help me recruit. You can email me if you just have any questions. You can recommend me for various seminars. I do research talks, but a lot of different keynote addresses. This is the time and age of podcasts. So if it's a science podcast or any type of podcast, I'm more than willing to be a part of actually getting this, this word out there on the important things that 
are being done in the lab that haven't necessarily been shared. And then funding calls, send them my way. I'll share them with you as well. And um, with that, uh, I just want to thank you all for your time. I really hope that this, uh, this year kicks off a very important year for you, that everything that you're working on, you will receive the rewards and the fruits of. And uh, please feel free to add me on Twitter and what have you. And I'd like to keep the discussion going. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Wood. That was such an amazing talk. Um, and I learned a lot, um, even being within like BME because biomedical and, and neural engineering is so diverse. It's, you're, you're learning so many different things. Um, and it was very, very inspirational. Um, so. Congrats a lot. Um, we do have a lot of questions from the audience, a lot of science questions, which I'm excited about. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, the first one. Um, would there be any limitations um, in this application for studying neurodevelopment disorders uh, for children in general? Any limitations? Um, I don't necessarily think that there are limits, limitations to studying using these devices in children. I think a big challenge with children, especially with MRI devices, is just keeping them still. Um, so I don't think there's limitations. I think there's higher protocols, uh, but that would just be a, a, a very you know, general answer to that. Okay, um, we have another question. Um, would multi-band fMRI sequences be theoretically possible with the TTT coil? Yes. Yes, they will be. Great question. Um, so yes, they definitely are. There are some multiband sequences that we work on with the TTT coil. Uh, I would say most sequences you can work uh, with our TTT coil, um, but yes, the answer is yes. Um, is the spherical phantom ever brain doped uh, versus water doped? And if yes, how does the, this compare to the anthropomorphic phantom that's brain doped? Great question. So yes, the spherical phantom, you could put brain, um, brain dope in there. Uh, the results aren't necessarily something that um, would be that grand of a challenge. Um, what you are able to see, the biggest difference is really in the electric field. So um, for my papers, it wasn't something that it was like personal data, which I looked at, uh, but it wasn't something that I added to the papers. But um, it, it's more so important in the larger uh, head phantom. And so that's where shape plays a bigger part. But the electric field is also something that's imperative. Um, you mentioned the technical challenges for using EEG and F uh, nears with black subjects, um, like different hair types to melanin, in because um, those techniques were mainly tested on white subjects. Are there any familiar challenges or differences to keep in mind when applying fMRI to black subjects? Um, I can say from my experience, it's not necessarily uh, skin, uh, but our, our hair is an impact. Um, what I noticed probably what's more interesting is that a lot of the coils that are designed um, work for smaller, smaller head sizes like Asian heads, but for whatever reason, American heads and African heads are huge. Um, and so if you had hair to that, sometimes the challenge is putting that hat and helmet on there. Um, in addition, it could be that when you are on the inside of the scanner, uh, if your hair has oil, a lot of that will show up really bright. Um, so it doesn't take away from what you can look on at the inside of your brain. It doesn't take that away. It's just more so artifacts that can be developed. But to, to get around that, they may tell you, you know, take your hair down or, you know, wash your hair before coming. All right. Um, and um, we're going to go ahead and make this um, the very last question because we're running out of time. Um, do you have any advice on Black neuroscientists who may be, you know, the only one or the few uh, one of the few in their programs. Um, how did you combat potentially uh, frequenting microaggressions or feelings that you did not belong in the environment? And did that uh, have any effects on you? Yeah, great question. Actually, most of those experiences really came for me in my undergraduate degree, not necessarily my graduate degree. But uh, to, to that point, I think it's, I think it's important to to reach out to spaces. So I had spaces at the University of Pittsburgh, Pitt Drive community, alumni from the Pitt Excel community, a Nesby community, 
Um, just find those different communities, my gem fellow community, where you know people that are like you focused on a common goal. So even if you're not necessarily getting that same degree, someone who's in the trenches with you, when you're getting ready to finish your PhD, being a part of writing groups, those were tremendous to me. Um, even if I wasn't necessarily the person that was always writing, just going to write something that collective motiva motivation makes a difference. So find your space. Um, how do you deal with microaggressions? That is a ton of conversations that we can have, but when appropriate, sometimes it's worth addressing those um, microaggressions or macroaggressions. And so whether it be something that you have to individually report uh, to hire, you know, uh, ups that something is not, this is not right, I should not be experiencing something like this, you should. Um, if it's something that can be addressed in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, in a polite way, you'd be surprised how much you're actually teaching people. So um, sometimes you should be encouraged to have those conversations. Okay, um, thank you so much. That was a very informal um, talk and a very interesting research. Um, I'm biased because I'm neuroengineering and I do a lot of neuroimaging. So I thought it was chef's kiss. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, and please enjoy the rest of the week. Um, continue to follow us um, on Twitter and hashtags, um, but also uh, check your emails for the links for the rest of the uh, webinars and um, events for the week. Thank you guys so much. Great talk.